Hello and welcome to the November edition of The Coal Scene. Uh, I'm here in the studio uh, this afternoon with Jeff Herholt, the director of the West Virginia Division of Energy. We're going to be joined a little later on in uh, today's show uh, by Bill Rainey, president of the West Virginia Coal Association. And we're going to be talking about some current uh, events, uh, some, some production uh, trends, uh, perhaps uh, we'll get into uh, uh, future uh, trends and future uh, markets for West Virginia coal. Uh, but we're just so pleased that uh, Jeff has taken the time to uh, join us uh, here today uh, within in, in, the, in, in the studio. Jeff, thanks so much for coming Certainly by. Certainly, it's, it's, it's always a, my a pleasure to be here. Well, we, you know, you're just such a such a source of, uh, you know, up to date and timely information heading heading the Department of Energy as you do, and I know you get around, uh, you know, get around the state and talk to a lot of people within the in, within the coal industry, sure. but mm -hmm. other in, energy industries as well, and you just seem to always uh, have the have a good pulse on Great. on what's going on out there. Uh, I know you just uh, your agency has just completed a a blueprint. I think we talked about that uh, before, uh, which serves as an inventory of uh, various energy sources, percentages that we uh, get from the different uh, uh, base fuels sure. and, and energy for electric uh, electric generation. And uh, I know you also just conducted a series of hearings. Uh, uh, in hopes of putting together a new energy, energy, energy plan. plan. Right. But our, our office was created in 2007. The first activity we conducted in 2007 was, was a, the development of the first West Virginia State Energy Plan. That's a five-year plan that goes through 2012. So the plan that we, uh, we had, had public hearings in uh, Huntington, Morgantown, and Martinsburg. And uh, we used, uh, we are using Marshall University and uh, West Virginia University to bring the ideas uh, uh, together that would make our new energy plan. We, we're, we're now going through the, uh, the public uh, comments we received. Now, oh. uh, what, what, what are some of the trends or developments uh, within the state's energy markets uh, here recently that, that uh, you know, have caught your attention? Well, certainly, certainly we have some dynamic trends going on right now. Uh, earlier this year, we were uh, confronted with the EPA issues concerning the um, uh, uh, what, st what started out as, as the clean air interstate rule. That's a requirement for um, our utilities meeting SOX, uh, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, and uh, mer mercury uh, uh, emission standards. The, the EPA's first thrust at this was to look at uh, system-wide uh, compliance. Uh, under the Obama administration, uh, uh, th th that was termed phase one. Phase two of the Clean Air Interstate Rule was blocked by Congress. Uh, the Obama administration, uh, through their EPA, came back with the uh, uh, cross-state air pollution rule, which is in effect phase two of the Clean Air Interstate Rule. Mm -hmm. And this requires plant-by-plant -plant compliance with SOX, NOx, and mercury standards. And what this rule does was uh, uh, require that all plants have stack gas scrubbers and low NOx burners. Uh, in, in West Virginia, we have made roughly five uh, billion dollars worth of investments in upgrading our elect electric utilities with stack gas scrubbers and low NOx burners. Uh, six of our plants, representing roughly 14 percent of our capacity, does not have those, uh, those standards. That those stack gas scrubbers, excuse me, stack gas scrubbers or, or low NOx burners. So, those six plants are um, are at risk. Uh, uh, Mon Power has actually closed their three plants. Um, the 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 bigger picture, when you look at West Virginia, again, 80 per, 86 percent compliance with with these standards. Na nationwide, we're only 50 percent compliant. So the real challenge now is with natural gas prices being so low on a national basis, what will these other electric utilities do to, to, to meet these new standards which are being challenged, as you know, in mm -hmm. court? I mean, are, are they going to, to make the investments to upgrade the coal plants or are they going to uh, uh, go, go the way of natural gas? Just, just to 
break the discussion a little bit. Uh, we have 13 power plants here within the state. Is that accurate? Okay, I meant that number, I, 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 believe, I believe that's correct. And there were six that, that have met, not met compliance, and three of those have been retired? That's correct, yes. Okay. So, so okay. It, it is, I mean, th these were older plants. Right. But a Appalachian Power certainly had in mind to keep these plants in mm -hmm. play through t 2015. Right, right. So, so they were ret retired prematurely, perhaps that's as correct. a result that, of that's the correct. Uh, as a result of a direct result of these rules. That's correct. And yes. with those plants, uh, you know, seems like I read uh, the couple hundred workers at those plants. Yes, uh, uh, there, there, there was a significant employment loss, mm -hmm. right? And of course, the revenues, taxation to those yeah. communities, very important. Oh, to, sure. To I mean, the, the, and to the local it, communities. Right. I mean, the, the, these uh, uh, power plants are typically in, in rural areas of the state. Mm -hmm. I think those are the, the the three that were mentioned at least, or two of the three were in North Central and right. Well, you you have <coughs> a, a, the Kamer plant in in Marshall County, mm -hmm. Canal River, Canal County, Phillipsborn in Mason County, Albright in Preston County, Reesville in Marion County, and the, uh, Willow Island in Pleasants County. The, the, uh, those are the six. Hey, you also mentioned that you know again that that f only fifty percent of the nation's plants were in compliance. Correct. Correct. Uh, which, which is scary. Oh, it's very, it's frightening. I, I mean, because, you know, we, what we've seen in, in, in 2000, there was a steep increases in the price of natural gas. Mm -hmm. Okay, power plants uh, or the electric utilities mm -hmm. moved away from natural gas as a fueling source and went to coal. Okay, so you had a lot of uh, natural gas plants that were mothballed. So when natural gas went to $2 an MCF because of overproduction of natural gas, the, uh, these power plants that were mothballed in early in t 2000 were, uh, were, were put back in play. So it, it isn't that our, our utilities have responded with new power plants, you know, instantly. It's that these older um, natural gas fi fired power plants were, were now put back in service. So we're seeing, so we're in seeing, we are seeing an increase in gas consumption. S certainly are, yes, time. right. Uh, and I don't think that comes by any surprise. Cause no, I mean, we, 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 we are, are, I mean, our state natural gas production has literally, within the last year, has increased by uh, a third. I mean, we, we're, we're now um, over roughly 60% of the natural gas that's produced in the state is now exported. We are the only state in our region that exports a, a natural gas. All other states are uh, it's a natural or a, uh, uh, an importer? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yes. It, and it's interesting, an, an, an interesting number is 10% of all gas wells in, in the United States are in the state of uh, West Virginia. 10%. 10%. Amazing. Hmm. Yeah, it really is. It really is. And 60% of that is being exported. Exported, right. Only 40% of the gas that's produced here. It, it, it's used here, it but used but here. It, it should. I mean, one of the real benefits of, of low natural gas prices is on this, uh, is with our uh, manufacturing sector. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we've lost. You know, when, when natural gas last spiked, we lost a considerable amount of our manufacturing uh, base in the state of West Virginia due to uh, due to the increased pricing of, of base fuel. Right. Yeah. So I mean, hopefully, with with these lower prices, we'll be able to attract the, uh, those mm -hmm. types of industries back. It's interesting uh, because the the coal industry, in terms of export and in-state consumption, isn't far off of our natural gas figures. Right. You know, I think we we export out of the state of West Virginia, export uh, the 65, 68, Correct. Correct. Close, yes. close somewhere in there, somewhere right. around 65 percent, uh, maybe a little higher, maybe 70 percent. It's uh, it's interesting to see how much coal is being exported to Europe now. Mm -hmm. I mean, all this. The, what we saw early on as a concern of emissions came from mm -hmm. Western Europe, and now Western Europe is a principal importer of our coal. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it's just the things change. The things change, and uh, you know, it's a. Uh, uh, boy, I don't want to get too much into the climate, but it's right. almost like the client climate. Uh, right. You know, it's a long time well, when you get into climate change, sure. where the weather changes all sure. the time, but but well, on a daily basis, but but climate. You know, it takes uh, t some some sustained time. But you, uh, but you can see how how difficult it is to predict energy price movements. Mm -hmm. And we it, a, a couple years ago we would had we had no idea that the price of natural gas would be down at 
two bucks. Now no, it's, it's no. at three dollars and twenty-five cents an MCF. Marcella shale uh, right. gas, it, it, Unicus it, right. shale gas, no doubt. Uh, new new fields, very plentiful, very uh, very low cost at the present time. Right. Uh, you know, there's there's some who predict that as gas prices naturally creep upwards. Because uh, you know the economics probably uh, you know mo a lot of these uh, Marcellus uh, g wells in particular were were not drilled on dollar uh, you know economics. That's right. That's so right. so as those prices you know trend upward over the next couple of years, uh, coal uh, will regain yes, sir, will likely will. regain some right. of that market share. Right. I mean the uh, T Boone Pickens had a prediction that by the end of this year natural gas will be at of uh, $4 an MCF. Uh, the, the industry has said that in, in their new uh, 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 wells they're drilling, it takes $4.50 to actually make money off those wells. So, I mean, the, the, and, and at $4.50, coal can compete with natural gas. You mentioned the export market for coal, Jeff, and uh, I, I read something recently where, you know, uh, steel consumption worldwide will will increase on the order of magnitude of 50 percent over the next seven or eight years. Uh, export of metallurgical coal uh, in and of itself will will uh, perhaps right. double over the over the next uh, same period of time seven seven or eight years. Uh, you know a lot of steel a lot of met coal needed for for uh, places uh, Asia, uh, India, right. China which is you know, which are countries, uh, and, and even Africa to a certain extent, are consuming a lot of met coal, a lot of steel, right. as those countries develop. Uh, so, right. at, at our last energy summit, we had a presentation by Ernie Thrasher on the, the, the significance of met coal in, in the state of West Virginia. No, Ernie's Ernie's uh, Ernie's an international right. Right. Uh, marketeer of uh, met coal, right. and and uh, certainly a uh, you know a solid a solid resource. Uh, you mentioned that I'm going to get into the export with, uh, of coal with, with President Rainey sure. here in a few moments, but, but uh, you, know, you mentioned exports have risen. I think they have actually doubled over the past uh, six or seven years. Uh, in fact, there was concern, as hard as this is to believe, there was concern several years ago that the United States could very easily was just within a few tons of being a net importer of coal. Amazing. Uh, and during that time, and it's only been five, six years ago, you know, 2006, 2007, we were actually importing uh, 30 some million tons of coal into this country, you know, from South Africa, right. Indonesia, Colombia. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and we were only exporting uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 39, 40 million tons. Right. And I think last year we broke 100 million for the uh, tons being exported for the, for the second consecutive year, first time in, in many years. Yeah, the, the markets are changing all the time. It's do, you, do you see, uh, there, there's been report Re recently that, that suggests that the downward trend we're seeing in coal production from central Appalachians in states like West Virginia, Kentucky, Virginia, uh, that it will likely, we will likely see uh, uh, a continued uh, decrease of production from these regions while places like the Illinois Basin and Western Mining uh, re operations uh, will will in increase. Well, I, I certainly think our uh, competition does come from the Illinois Basin. I mean, it, it's it's difficult for uh, Wyoming to ship coal this far. Mm -hmm. um, but it, when you look at where our coal goes, I mean, it, it, to think that Italy, Italy is the number one importer of, of, of West Virginia coal is it's pretty amazing. You know, I think we are challenged, I and mean, we're challenged, uh, but markets change, and mm -hmm. I think we, uh, we, we will certainly adapt. Well, it, it, it begs the question, can the state of West Virginia do more to help slow, you know, that uh, decreased pro production from, from West Virginia? Yeah. You know, what, what are some areas, how can the state help the industry 
uh, in that regard. You know, are there are there incentives? Are there uh, you know policy programs that that the state can look at that would would better serve the the industry and the export market? Sure, the export market. I mean, I, I think it, I think a, a big policy component is our own domestic, and I, and I know what you're saying, the export, mm -hmm. export market is very important. But we, we are, the, the coal is here. I mean, it, it has an advantage to, to, to use the coal here in our country. I mean, we, we need a competitive advantage in the manufacture of, uh, of goods. You know, coal, coal has been our, uh, our ticket to, to being able to produce heavy, heavy goods at a competitive price. I, I certainly think while, while exports are important, but we need to ensure that our policymakers here appreciate the role of coal in our economy. I don't think there's any question. Jeff, we have to take a short break here, and I want to thank you for coming by Certainly. and uh, you know, just giving us an update on the state's uh, energy portfolio. And as we typically do, we'll get you back in here in a month or two and okay. kind of get a status report at that time. Thanks so much. Very good, very good. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back here just momentarily with Bill Rainey, uh, president of the West Virginia Coal Association. six stairs takes determination. So will getting into college. I've got what it takes. So do you. Welcome back to the November edition of the Coal Seam. I'm joined here in the studio uh, by Bill Rainey, president of the West Virginia Coal Association. Bill, thanks for taking time to join us here this afternoon. I appreciate uh, being here, Chris. Appreciate all you do and appreciate, uh, of course, everything that the coal industry does for the state. We just talked with Jeff Hareholt, uh, who heads up the Division of Energy. Right. And uh, we, we were talking about, uh, you know, some markets for West Virginia coal, uh, export market, domestic market. We were also talking about, you know, the current slump that we find the state's uh, leading industry in. Right. Uh, with decreased productivity, uh, Jeff was was uh, reminding us that we just had, uh, I think, three power plant closures and people laid off from those plants and communities that, you know, no longer have the benefit of all the economics from from those plants. Uh, what what's going on right now? It seems to be a lot of. Well, it's a it's a tough time now, Chris, as you well know. It's. Uh, we talk about it being the perfect storm. It's a function of the economy, the natural gas prices, the weather, uh, and then of course all the regulation that you have coming out of the federal government in Washington, uh, and it's creating uncertainty. But you know, the power plant closing is removing that future look that we have. You know, everybody says, well, you've been through this before, so you'll come through it again. But what they're doing is they're removing some of that future opportunity out there with these plants and with these aggressive air quality rules. I think Jeff probably talked about those and, and how they have pushed the schedule up on that. And so it, it's just all coming to bear right now in the coal industry, it seems like. And uh, while I, I looked the other day and I thought, you know, if you live in another state, you can probably think about this not being so uh, such a major issue. And, and you can quickly discount coal if you live in New York or uh, if you live in New Hampshire or someplace like that. But when you think about it in West Virginia, it's such a huge part, not only of our heritage, but of, of our current day budget, revenue stream, employment, and all of that. So it's really coming to roost here. And we've got to take some steps to make sure that we're mining, able to mine the coal seams that are remaining. And there's plenty of coal left, but as you would suspect, it's, it's a little more difficult to get to. Uh, it's a little more challenging uh, to create the productivity it's necessary to stay in the marketplace. And so everybody's got to join together here, and we, we've got to figure out some ways to make sure that we're mining coal in 2018 and 2020 and 2025 uh, for the future of not only our state, but of our people here. 
you know, one of the things I do is I sit here and uh, have have this conversation. I think a certain uh, certain uh, you know just real major points or uh, or issues, and, and it just occurred to me as we were talking about these power plants closing, right? That uh, when you when you put coal and the electric utility industry together, uh, that tax uh, you know that they that's created is is what 60 65 percent or so of the state's last, business. Last time we did a calculation on it was about 60 percent of the business taxes and there's been some new things come in and there's been some alterations to that but I would suspect it's clearly 50 or 60 percent of the business taxes that are collected in the state. That's substantial when you when you talk about the coal industry you talk about 20 percent of the state's jobs uh, maybe a little higher percentage of the state's uh, income uh, and and certainly the tax revenues but, uh, but th that's that's just a real significant piece of our uh, of our state's budget. Well it is and, and and of course people accuse us of being selfish about it and uh, only talking about the coal industry but when you put it in the broad perspective of the business community and the population for that matter uh, first of all the consumers are going to be confronted with higher electricity bills because of all this stuff that the EPA is doing and and they're driving up the price of coal too with all the regulation and things that are surrounding it and, and I don't mean we don't need regulation, but some of it is just absolutely absurd and overreaching. Uh, but when you think about who in, the, who in this state's going to make up $500 million of severance tax, it's going to fall back on somebody if you want state government to sustain the services that they currently have. And when you put it in that perspective, then I hope it gets everyone's attention because you think about how critical it is that we have almost 20,000 people mining coal today. Mm -hmm. And that's about the size of uh, probably Princeton or Bluefield or uh, cities like that. And those people are gainfully employed, making a good wage, contributing to the economy. You don't have that, then it's a tremendous, tremendous pull on West Virginia as to where is that going to come from. We're down a little bit in production this year and in employment numbers. There's 2,000 people laid off today or Roughly, more. that's the number they use. Uh, you know, how about how about productivity down? Well, production's down. I think it's down about seven percent the last time I looked uh, from the EIA reports. Uh, the majority of that's in southern West Virginia. Uh, northern West Virginia is is staying pretty even to what they had last year. That's comparing year to year, but. Uh, and yeah. that's been repeated over the last couple, three years, 7%, 10%. So. Yeah, we are. We'll probably be all uh, using 2008 as a comparative uh, reference then. We're probably going to be off 30, 35 million tons of coal. Well, that's a lot. Puts what down, down to 120, 120 some million. 125, probably something like that. And, uh, and and that is that's significant, and that's been invisible, you know, because mm -hmm. the price has been very, very strong. So when you begin to calculate severance tax, and if the price is strong and the volume's down, then you don't notice it. Now we're not only having volume down, but the price is down. So it's going to begin to take some notice at the at the capital. The other thing that Jeff mentioned that caught my attention, uh, and I guess I'd heard this before, but but he said in the case of uh, uh, you know first first energy and more importantly uh, AEP in this discussion, he said they actually wanted to run those plants uh, a couple three more years uh, because they are older plants and they had planned to retire those plants. I think he said 2015. Huh. So when you think about that, I mean, that's, that's just almost unacceptable that here they were wanting to run those plants for three more years, uh, you know, give people a, an opportunity to transition into other occupations, other professions, probably had people, you know, within a couple years <clears throat> of retirement. Right. And, and to think that just because of this, you know, federal policy or federal initiative that they were forced to shut those plants today. And, oh, and just couldn't extend the life three years. It's, I mean, it's inexcusable, uh, I think. I mean, you look at Albright, look at the mm -hmm. small community of Albright just outside Kingwood and Preston County. You probably don't have any place in the state's got cleaner air, uh, and they're working on the water from, you know, mm -hmm. past mining. Of course, they've been spending years up there getting it fixed up. It has nothing to do with the power plant. And then this aggressive schedule comes in, this impossible compliance, and forces them into the retirement, which is, it's crazy. I mean, it's it just absolutely crazy, and it's occurring in two other places, mm -hmm. and then it's occurring in many places outside West Virginia, which is very disturbing, and I'm sure 
I mean, you take that, take Reevesville, it's going to have a huge impact on Reevesville. And, and I think about Glen Lynn just across the line down in Virginia, that, you know, Glen Lynn depends on that power plant down there so much. And there's not a whole lot more that goes on in Glen Lynn. It's a beautiful place, not a whole lot of industry down there. So, and, and that's a huge uh, void when that plant closes down in Virginia. And, and those are decisions that once made are going to be terribly difficult to reverse, especially when, when you have an administration that has basically drawn a line in the sand and has said no new power plants. That's, that's so right. So yeah. it just really compounds the Yeah, the, it's very disturbing. And, you know, it's disturbing to us because we're in the coal industry and we think about that stuff all the time. But it's terribly disturbing to these communities. And as you talked about, the workers are there, mm -hmm. some nearing retirement, some could get their tenure. Uh, and, but yet it, it's, uh, it's a bunch in Philadelphia or Washington that are making these artificial timelines, maybe because of a lawsuit, maybe because of their own uh, initiative. But they seem to give very, very little attention to the impact that it has on the way of life in these communities uh, in Virginia and West Virginia and Ohio is also affected. Looking forward, uh, you know, perhaps not, not, not the remaining time in 212 or early 213, but seems to be opportunity on the export market. Uh, seems to be some growing markets in Asia, and maybe just with West Virginia being a leading export state. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing to me that uh, you know. Coal is the fastest growing fossil fuel in the world, according to all the expert analysts out here. Has been for eight years. So all these other countries are wanting coal, wanting our coal, wanting American coal and West Virginia coal. Thank goodness they do. And you know now we've got a country here that is trying to diminish the use of it, diminish the mining of it. Makes absolutely no sense when you think about America having more coal than any other country in the world. We exported last year, I think, more coal than we'd ever exported as a country. We had about half of that export. So every other ton of coal that leaves the shores of this country comes from West Virginia, employs West Virginians, and, and is good for the state. As we've talked about, as we've heard, others have said, the seams are getting more difficult to access. You know, they got more impurities in them, they take more separation technologies, and in order to get that capital investment the state and everybody's got to join together here and we got to make sure that we provide that kind of access to these coal seams. There's a lot of coal left, but it's very high capital to get it developed. So we've got to look this year, next month, next year, as to how can we encourage that? Because what we're looking at is trying to maintain that